Wow, I was starting early. I'm amazed. That's pretty awesome. Okay, so my talk is Maintaining Your Code Clint Eastwood Style. And I promise during this talk that I will not rant at any chair that is, you know, no one sitting at because um, I, I don't want this to be a political talk. I want it to be a talk where we can talk about how can you deal with good, bad, and ugly code that you wrote, that someone else wrote. Um, this is a picture of Clint Eastwood at age 80. Now, this is an 80-year-old guy. He's an actor. Doesn't he look gorgeous? Um, and his comment is about his success is it's due to a lot of instinct and a little luck. So he just had it, right? He's just cool. Um, I don't think that most of us are so cool. Right? For me, um, whatever success I've had, and I've had some success, is through a lot of hard work and a little luck. One of my little luck things was I was able to be involved at the very start of object-oriented programming in small talk. So I learned a lot from people like Ward Cunningham and Alan Wurfsbrock and other people who really knew, you know, so timing is, is really important to learn things. So um, I hope that um, over the next two days we can share some of our experiences and that you can get a little uh, luck through some hard work that we do together. Um, so, let's talk about good code, and this is uh, Clint in one of his early famous movies. Um, he was known as Blondie, you know, the man with no name. You know, he's this kind of really tough guy. He's a bounty hunter, and he teams with Tuco and Angel Eyes to find buried gold, all right? So, how do I deal with good code? One of my favorite people in the world, and he happens to also live in Portland, is Ward Cunningham. How many of you know Ward? All right. He's invented everything that's really important, <laughs> including the wiki. And if I went to Ward for inspiration, um, Ward has this quote. He talks about the notion of working with the program like an artist works with a lump of clay. And you go, what the heck does that mean? And, and he talks about an artist who wants to make a sculpture out of clay. But before she can make the sculpture, she just massages the clay. Right? And she sees what the clay wants to do. And the more that she handles the clay, the clay tends to do what she wants. You have to warm up the clay. And, and Ward basically says, you know, that's the same with a development team. You start out, and when you start programming, the code isn't very flexible. It's stiff. And so as a team works together over a period of months, and they really care about creating something of value of goodness, it becomes more flexible to their will. And they discover what the clay wants to do as they build functionality. Now, Ward is quite an inspirational guy, and he writes um, very elegant code, and when it gets big and complicated, he actually moves on to other things. Um, but. He starts out simply, and he adds complexity. Here's an example of, I've been working on this uh, reference application for a client where we're doing uh, magazine fulfillment, subscription fulfillment. And here's an example of the last couple of months where I did some programming where I started out with time-based and issue-based subscriptions. And I, this is my UML, I sketched it by hand here. And there was months and years and an integer count quantity. And, you know, it started out pretty simple. I had um, 
four common things that all of those classes implemented. My very first version. My second version, I went, oh, I, I think I need to have time-based quantities, <coughs> and they're doing different things. And then I figured out that time-based units I needed to convert from months to years, and that I can't add issue-based quantities to time-based quantities. And so it got a little complicated. And the next thing that I did was something like that. And the current definition got more complicated. Adding to a year returned a new month quantity unless the units were years, blah, blah, blah. And the current version has a bunch of, the interface got a little bit bigger. So, and actually, it just over the late last sprint that we just had, it got added even another method. And so what started out, I thought, I'm going to do this really cool demonstration of quantities. It got more complicated. So I look at Ward and thinking, oh, did my clay get more flexible or did it just get uglier? Well, it did what it had to do. And so, I'm happy that Ward, even though he does these very beautiful small bits of code, has also told us that let's write a program. You start out simple, but realize that tomorrow we're going to have to make it more complicated because it's got to work. It's going to do more. So that's kind of the way it is. So we may start out simple, but anything that's really in production loses some of that simplicity. And hopefully what we create when we write a program is as simple as it needs to be, and that we'll work to preserve simplicity as our code grows. Now, I imagine that most code that you work on has been living for a while. So it gets complicated. Things get complicated. Um, here's another example of good code starting out. Um, and so I'm on sprint five of this current project that we're working on. And the first sprint was crazy sprint, right? Where um, we wanted to use a domain-driven design approach, but we didn't really have a consistent error detection and reporting mechanism in our services that were interacting with our domain objects. And so sometimes setter methods would throw exceptions. This is again in Java. And sometimes they didn't check for anything at all because there's this other school of thought that says fail fast, right? Let, let whoever calls handle it. And then I said, this is crazy. We've got to get more consistent. And so we kind of instituted this um, change where we said domain object constructors need to at least create a well-formed object. We should throw exceptions and that services should catch and do their best to report them and not just stop at the first error, but collect all the possible errors coming from the web page. Sometimes objects could get into inconsistent states, and not all errors were detected because we didn't go bother back and fix up everything that was already there. So sprint three, because we're writing more code, got a little irritated about that. And my colleague Jim created this error reporting service that we then made all of our services support that. Oops. And we can now collect and report a set of errors rather than just mailing. The sprint before this last one, we changed our error messages as we should have done from day one, but we didn't, to using external resources. 
and we could throw in parameters and have them put into our error messages, and we supported internationalization. And, well, but we haven't yet got around to it. Maybe we'll do uh, this error validator class for cross-attribute checking in our services. But we haven't got there yet, because we don't want to overdo the design. So, I, in this case, we're talking about evolving code, thinking about starting from the beginning. Maybe you already have stuff that's already there, but here was an opportunity where we started from ground zero, from the very beginning. We didn't start out with the ultimate Uber framework. We grew it as, as we added more code. And it, I will tell you that even with maybe um, for sprints, when you go back in and add a new capability to take and internationalize and externalize your error messages, that took several hours to go retrofit all the existing code that we already had. So wouldn't it be nice if I could have you know, thought of that beforehand? Well, I didn't. Uh, typically, if you come to a project with an experienced set of developers, they all have their set of good practices that they try to start, but sometimes we add them in as we go. And it takes some kind of discipline to do that. So here's an example of the code. By the way, I don't expect you to spend all the time reading all the code here. I just want to show some code talking about error reporting services and all the subclasses that can do that. And there's this abstraction called a multiple message exception that could hold <coughs> multiple errors that were detected. And so, for example, creating an account, because customers have accounts in this application, um, we could then get these arguments, verify required parameters, and then handle errors. And if we could collect up errors as we go, um, then finally we could persist it if it was, if there were no errors. So anytime there was an error that could happen, it would bail out if there was a, an exception thrown. So we had checkpoints of setting up values in the service. So what starts out simple, and Ward is really good uh, at starting out simple and keeping it simple, it gets harder to do as you add more code. It just does. Um, so back to Clint. What does Clint do in this case? If you're trying to keep your code good, maybe you need to do something. You have to take things into your own hands. Okay, it's your problem, not their problem, or your teammate's problem. In fact, the pragma pragmatic programmer guys, Dave Thomas and Andy Hunt, talk about the broken window theory. And what they're saying is, if the windows are not repaired, if you have a broken window in your code, that's something that's a little bit not so good, um, the more of those that are sprinkled around in your code, the more tendency it is when you work with your code to just leave, to make your own broken windows. I don't know, it's fun to create broken windows. I don't think it's, well, maybe toss a rock. Um, but if you see broken windows all around you, it's not like you're going to try to be as clean and make be good as you can as well. So it turns out that I found this to be very true. If I'm starting out and I'm a little bit sloppy, maybe it takes someone else on my team to look at my code and say, Rebecca, fix this. And it's really good if you have someone who is one of those anal retentive persons who just likes things to look really good. 
Um, my colleague Jim is like this. Um, I was quite happy in one of my tests to, um, I, I declared that ex I expected the exception inside and it was going to be thrown as soon as I passed in illegal arguments to create a user. This is a user and password test. And Jim didn't like that um, I was getting some warnings in my Java code because that was never called. And so he changed all these little things so that the expected illegal argument exception was on the outside because then we didn't get this warning in our code. And you go, oh my goodness, isn't he being a little bit obsessive? But he doesn't like any warnings, any things like that, because he wants to have warnings just really mean something, not just be gratuitous. That's just an example of one of the most annoying little things that Jim, Jim asked him to do. Fix this up, please. Now, in my mind, that wasn't really a broken window because my test passed, it worked just fine. But if you have someone like that, it can really help you keep things good. It's also the case that when you are going through and starting out with that clay and building things a little bit at a time, you can go through these cycles. And I just took um, some of the logs from the GitHub repository that we've been working on, um, that you go through this creation, restructuring, cleanup cycles. It's not always that you're always keeping things clean, although the code and craftsmanship folks would say every day be cleaning, right? Um, I, I find that I go through these waves of cleaning things up. Um, I have to get my campground a little dirty and, and feel that dirt <laughs> before I then go and clean it up. Because um, maybe I'm just so excited coding, right, that I don't want to you know, clean it up until I go, oh yeah, that's pretty ugly. So we went through over a period of, this is a week sprint. We refractored the, the package structure after we did it. Um, we made our class variables private. It was in sort of not actually private for testing, but okay. We used our message handler class, and we did our repository, and then we refactored the test data. Even the test data got refactored so it could be shared. And so it wasn't just my code that was production code, it was the test that got refactored as well. And then um, we fixed our external password generator, salt generation, and Jim said, oh, get your print statement, statements out of your test. You know, those are just there for you to feel happy that stuff is doing something. Just take them out. Um, so it's this wave of cleaning up as you go, create, test, restructure. And that's a pretty normal routine of keeping things good. I wish you all had Jim on your project, because he's one of those guys that's going to make sure your campground is kept clean. Maybe you are, Jim. Maybe that would be nice. If you are, I'm going to uh, pair a programmer, put pair a program with you later today, because <laughs> that would be fun. Now, this is a guy, I don't know how many of you know who Steve McConnell is. Um, he has such a smiley face, and he used to work for Microsoft. And he says, well, good code. We're talking about the good now is its own best documentation. <coughs> and I looked at that statement and I thought, hmm, hmm, maybe. I was writing code, again, this is for uh, passwords, and there's all these rules about it has to have one alpha character, must be one digit, must contain at least one letter and a number, and must contain non-space or non-printing characters, and there's these regular expressions that it has to match. You know what those are, right? Isn't that self-evident that regular expressions are doing? Come on, <laughs> isn't it? Ah, I don't think so. 
In fact, I used to, there's external regex testers that I could play with before I put it into my code to make sure that it worked in my tests. My exception messages turned out to document the rules, and without them I'd be lost, but I don't think that code is self-documenting. Steve is kind of pretty naive when it comes to regular expressions. They are not documentation, no matter how straightforward they are. Maybe you're regex experts. If you are, good. We want you on our team. Sometimes you have to write them. Okay, here's some more code. I was converting um, Korean addresses, actually Romanian addresses are the most complicated addresses in the world with all these, um, I don't know. I haven't sent, you, sent a letter here, it was like there were so many fields. Korean addresses are complicated too, and some fields are optional and some are not. And I was, this is a form matter to take addresses and convert them. And actually, the problem is that they're converting over in 2013, later this year, to a different address format. So there's two formats that are required. Okay. And if things are optional and the building name exists, then you can append the numbers. Anyway, this is a bunch of code that's formatting what is presented for an, uh, uh, an address from South Korea. And my comment, again, to Steve McConnell is that, okay, this is good code, but it's tedious code to write. There's a lot of tests I had to write to prove that this code worked. The more things you can do to make it legible, good for you. Um, but good code is not beautiful code, and don't confuse goodness with beauty, and it isn't really necessarily self-documenting, it just works. So let's talk about some other aspects of good code. Because maybe you have someone who helps you keep your campground clean, right? And maybe they irritate you because you don't like all those people telling you to clean up, right? If you're Dirty Harry, or Clint as Dirty Harry, yeah, you tried being reasonable, but you didn't like it, right? God, they're making me be reasonable. So maybe instead of having someone being an enforcer, why don't you just have a style guide? We can all agree on the style guy, right? If you just follow that style, at least we'll have that goodness. I mean, you still maybe you need an enforcer like Clint there to say, okay, if you aren't gonna do this, make my day. So one of the things um, that I was questioning as I was putting together this talk is do style guides really help you? What do they do? And I'm using as an example what I saw in the Android app style guide from Google. The Google guys should know how to do it, right? <laughs> Shouldn't they tell us what to do? Okay. So Clint, this is Clint in real life, says, respect your efforts, respect yourself. Self-respect leads to self-discipline. And maybe that style guide will help too. Okay, I don't know if you've looked at the Google Style Guide. Um, I have a link to it. It might be an interesting thing to do in a, in a uh, open space to look at the guide and, and talk about it. Um, but I want to go through some of the points of the Style Guide because uh, I tried being reasonable and sometimes it makes me mad. Very first thing they talk about is import statements. Again, you're writing in Java, so you have to have import statements. <clears throat> Put the Android imports first, third parties, and then Java, and it should say Java X. Okay. Formatting, alphabetical within its grouping with capital letters before lowercase letters, 
a blank line between each major grouping, and then use explicit class names instead of splat, so you can't say J unit star, you have to put each class that you're doing by name. And I thought about this and I said, well, oh, that means I can't even be lazy. I, have to, I can't even use the splat. I have to put each class by name, okay? I know I use Eclipse, so I can do Control Command O, and it'll put the class name in there for me. But my first reaction to this was style over substance. Okay. So that's just import statements. Okay, I can handle that. You know. Then they have naming conventions that start non-public, non-static field names with an M. I don't know why. Not a G, not an A for Android, I don't know. Start static field names with an S or static, I guess. Um, all other fields with lowercase and public static. One shout at you, okay. I'm not going fine. Now, we'll get down to some more of their style guide. They had field definitions. And the problem was, they started out saying, define fields in standard places. Places. Not just one place, places. At the top of the file or before methods that use them. Which one? Okay. Right? They, didn't, they gave me two ways of doing it. All right, as soon as you give anybody two ways of doing it, there's going to be inconsistency, right? But they don't want to be brutal about their style. They're not going to enforce one way. There's two ways. Okay, which one is preferred? No hints, no guide, no choice, I pick. Okay. Now here's where I really started getting irritated. Because I happen to really worry about exception handling a lot. This one I like. Okay, the first one was the prime directive. You know, do no harm, right? Never swallow an exception. So if you're a Java programmer, how many of you have ever swallowed an exception? Oh, okay. All right, you're not on my team. I have two, by the way. All right, it's impossible to happen, so I try to catch it and just throw it away. Just ignore it, don't even log it, just catch it because I don't want to re-throw it and I just have to do something with it. But don't do that. Never swallow an exception. And this is the second one, I love this one too, because I work with a guy, Dom, his name is Dominic, and all he would ever do was catch exceptions. Not in any specific class, but exception. And then he would figure out which exception was inside of what he caught. Wow. So don't catch exception. Catch a specific ones by name. Exception is the super class of all the real exceptions that you're throwing. And then, okay, so I thought, number two, that's good. I hated the code that catch caught exception. It's really hard to know which exceptions are there. Uh, you declare that you throw exception, just exception. They were bad code. Um, then there was a handling strategy. So remember this is for an Android app where you can't just fail because no one will buy your app from the marketplace. And you can't just log things and hope life is good. Um, so they're saying, here's a prioritized list of exception handling strategies. Throw a new exception that matches your level of scratch. Um, they didn't show an example for that, but if you were reading a resource and you've got a file I.O. error, you might want to recast it to a higher level of an exception, not just some very low level. Handle gracefully and when possible, substitute an appropriate default. Well, when I looked at that, I said, well, what should defaults be? 
is default behavior, let's say port 80 is a default port, um, is it always the right thing to do to just substitute a default? Or is it a copy? Um, substitute an appropriate default. That means I have to use my judgment. Okay. Um, the third prioritized list of handling strategies was catch and demo throw a runtime exception because your app should crash. Well, I didn't quite know why I had to re-throw it because it probably would have, but we won't go into that. Um, and then finally, the fourth guideline was if you ignore an exception, if you break the prime directive, just tell somebody why you did that in your code. So when I looked at these, and I could go on with their style guidelines, but I've devoted already enough time to the style guidelines. Um, I could go on with that. And the problem with this is it gives you a list of things to do. It gives you discretion so that you can choose to do things or not. You can have arguments and debates with your team. People can do things differently. People can use defaults or not. And so it can lead to, you, even if, if more than one person is working on the code, or even me working on the code from one week to the next, it can lead to horrible inconsistencies. It really can. Because if I don't get down to that common way of handling default behaviors, default exceptions, logging, all that kind of stuff, then my code is going to be inconsistent, let alone your code and my code. So my reaction to this, and I, I jog, by the way, I'm a slow runner, so I call it joggers, is that I get lazy or bored programming if I have to follow too many rules. And even with good intentions, it's hard to be consistent as a programmer. It really is. It takes constant attention. You know, I think it's easier to be a consistent runner than it is to be a consistent programmer. That's me running a half marathon last year. Um, and I can tell you, if you were trying to run 13 miles, you have to train for that. You can't just start. You have to keep working at it. And you have to practice every week and as programmers, if we're trying to be good, we need to be practicing daily. So hopefully over the next two days, you get um, some practice and some motivation. So consistency is really hard. One of the things that I was happy about, and this is the last part of the Android style guide, is that they talked about our parting thought, be consistent. I didn't have their pictures, and they didn't, you know, the, the people who wrote the style guide didn't put their names to it, so they have the little Android answer. If you're editing code, take a few minutes to look at the code around you and determine its style. Good, good idea. And then they also said that local style is also important. So if this particular set of classes, this component is different, don't go back and try to retrofit it to the style over here. Now, I, I don't know how many of you have uh, worked with people who are compulsive, that you must use their style. Uh, <laughs> OK, so they go through and change everything to the uh, separator first and JavaScript style. You know, where they put the comma first. I've had people, I work with people like that. I think they waste the time. This is just my humble opinion. If there's a local style already there that is a consistent style, don't go. Just be, be aware of the local style. It's hard to go and retrofit a lot of code to style and have someone go back and fix it again to their preferences. So let's, so good code, just to summarize, good code 
happens, it grows, it takes consistency, it takes thought, it takes practice, it takes awareness. But most of us deal with bad care, I bet. At least I know I see a lot of bad care. Um, this is Angel Eyes, Lee Van Cleef in the Good God and Ugly. Um, first question I want to ask is how do you live with someone else's bad code? All right, you didn't create it. You have to write code that extends it, uses it, whatever. So I went and, because uh, I use Moodle, and I've extended Moodle, and I've used WordPress, I, I went to someone else's inspiration um, to see what they did, and their similar, their experience was very similar to mine. Um, And this is a kind of a story. Moodle, in case you don't know what it is, is for an online learning system. And it was built uh, before people uh, really knew uh, what they were doing. So it organically grew into this online learning system for managing courses and grading. I actually use it for my online courses. Um, And there's an e-learning platform, and there's source code, and, and there's a lot of database tables, like 200 tables. And wouldn't it be nice if it was really nicely done? But as Olya Petrovic was saying, because I thought this was, he, he said it as, as good as I could have said it. My first impression going into this Moodle and trying to work with it was confusion. Right? What the heck is going on? Some of the code is procedural, some is object oriented, some use global variables. And it says the database is a forest of related tables, not really normalized, you know, and, but it just is. And his comment was, well, I learned how to read and write it, to modify it. And even to write custom plugins. So he's, you know, he's done his time. Even when the log files aren't helping at all. So he learned how to do it, but his first reaction, he called this mess view controller <laughs> instead of model view controller. I love that. Mess view controller. Okay. He says, well, this isn't model view controller. In fact, logic is mixed everywhere, even in stored procedures. Okay, and the presentation. And it's a community software. So if you go to the Moodle online stuff, um, people have their opinions, and it comes out with later releases. And he says, I thought this was a piece of crap. This is, I'm, I'm paraphrasing again. He says, no one else in the community thought it was a problem, right? I can tell you with WordPress, I've had the same reaction when I've gone to the community and said this is. So his reaction in, in red is, summary is, it's not what I'm used to, it's not good. There weren't any norms that were established, it kind of just grew. Conventions, if any, grow organically and they change from release to release. Okay. And what's already there is not going to get fixed. Because technically it isn't broken. It's just bad or awkward or difficult or unreliable or not the way you do it. Okay. So if you live with bad code like that and you're having to extend it, what do you do? First of all, you've got to understand. I can tell you, my approach when I was doing WordPress was to try to understand as little as possible to get the job done. Right? Just, what can I do? I want to write three lines of PHP code and that's it. I want to add my little stuff to my browser, to my page. You know. But, 
In Moodle, you got to understand the database because it ties everything together. There's users and their courses and events and grades. And then you have to understand the platform because it's tied in with the database. Same thing for WordPress. I don't know how many of you are WordPress hackers, but. And this is actually a pretty cool picture. Um, go on to the uh, Moodle dev community site and there's all these nice ER diagrams of the tables. But this guy, Martin Langhoff, was using this little tool called Schema Ball and it shows you the associations between all the major tables in this little circular pattern. It's kind of pretty to look at. But if you notice that there are um, users and courses and events, and they're tied to everything. So it's a pile of crap, if you will, to really, you know, to really, if you're wanting to change stuff that's fundamental, it's a lot of work. So in this kind of environment where it's ugly and bad, bad, not ugly, but just bad, you got a strategy to do. You figure out how something similar is done, at least this is what I've done, and if I'm doing something similar, I'm just gonna like, take the minutest amount of change, make sure it works. I might write a plugin, or add a question type, or add a customer custom user profile field type. Those kind of things in Moodle are easy. Gets a little, uh, more dicey if you're overriding a class or a function, because you've got to get in there and hack. If you're hacking the core, you do it at your own risk, so people don't do that very often, right? So your strategy is tread lightly, don't mess with crap. Okay, so, so that's, you know, when I live with code that is bad that I didn't create, I don't own, I just need to make something work. I try to try lightweight. If I'm living with my own bad code, maybe you, you don't write bad code, but I know I do. <laughs> what do you do, all right? The conventional wisdom, and this is another blogger out there, is that when inexperienced developers write bad code, their code is just bad, it has few, Redeeming qualities often must be scrapped or the minimum refactored in text like that. It's conventional wisdom, and I'm going to challenge that. Um, I happen to be involved in the Agile conference sponsored by the Agile Alliance, and I'm the uh, co chair of the experience reports track. So if any of you ever want to write an experience report about your code, <laughs> I'd be happy to shepherd your paper. Um, I happen to be shepherding a paper this year by Amir Noman. And he lives in Egypt. And it will appear at Agile 2013 in August. So his paper is in flight where I just gave him the latest turnaround on his latest draft before I headed on the plane. So it's not yet finished, but I'm sharing you some of the some of the experiences, because I found this fascinating. I, I volunteered to shepherd this report because he was chartered with trying to help people who wrote really, 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 really bad code in Egypt to clean it up. And he started out with three teams. And initially, their approach was to take and <coughs> Say, we've got to write automated tests. You have no tests, got to write some. Then, let's identify some best practices and shove them into the code. And keep the code base working. He tried that with three teams. And they all failed for various different reasons. For one thing, their refactoring objectives were very vague, or just implement best practices. And actually, their code was so bad 
so bad, and I've had conversations with them, so bad that it couldn't, you couldn't write automated tests for them without enormous cost and expense. There was one transactional system for a bank that had three classes in the entire application. Input, processing, output? No, I don't think so, but it was like that. You know, how do you write a test for something that was just huge? Um, they didn't measure anything. They created, the developers kind of said, well, we kind of want to know what we want to do, and they had little management support. They went into really deep refactoring, and they never finished because they were on a separate branch. Management felt alienated from the development team, and they kept two separate uh, code bases working, the new code and the old code. Anyway, they did everything wrong in the book. And I said, I want to hear your story. He started out with his first experience report draft showing me what his new approach was, and I said, I want to know how you got there. And so I heard the bad stuff. And then he started out with this second set of teams that he's been working with. And they're doing this on a shoestring, not, not a whole lot of budget to do this. Their strategy was to prepare the code to be increasingly refactorable. And through a set of refactorings that are continuous and sustainable. So they wanted to do quick wins, and then structure the code, and write automated tests for the things after it was structured, because it was so crappy before. And then for components that they've isolated, then write tests, and then pull out the dependencies. So it was an ongoing process. And you think quick wins, one of the interesting quick wins is just removing code that's dead code, code that it cannot be reached by any um, call, pass. Another quick win was code duplicates. And it wasn't code that's similar, it was code duplicates. And then just be consistent, make the style look the same. So they also, try to, on the second go around, to try to do some measures so that people knew what was going on. Um, so, they're, and they were doing weekly iterations. Um, the code size, the code size reduction speed, you know, if they're doing refactorings, and removing dead code. And once it's stable, um, stop doing it. And then number of duplicated code lines, very simple measures. And they had some refactoring rules. Of course, you can break the rules. To, this time around, don't create a separate uh, branch, refactor on the main branch, and limit the scope first. Only do those quick wins, and then restructure and write tests that are automated. And the, the time allocated, again, had to have management support. It wasn't just the team deciding to clean up its own account. So here's some of the measures that they had. Um, and it's interesting. This one, just to point out, that dead code cost one team 36 hours to remove, and they used a tool in the .NET environment to help them do that. And it reduced 6.4% of the code. And you go, my goodness. And 46% of their code was duplicate. They just had duplicate code. So they had lines of code removed over iteration. So this is a period of four weeks. They removed 33,000 lines of code. And they had a target, theoretical target, but they stopped at this point. Um, and here's, a, it, this is another project. These are the simple measures that they showed. Um, code size reduction and speed. How, and, and they were quick, and then it got harder to reduce the code. Well, that kind of makes sense, you know, as you're, as you're going along. But again, this is over a period of a month. 
So they, they had these kind of simple measures that were visible. The management caught in on these. And um, Clint, this is again, he has a bandage on his head. Does it hurt sometimes? He says, a good man always knows his limitations. And what these people discovered, what Amir discovered was that you, when you're doing this sort of cleanup to a big mess, that it needs to be sustainable. Now they found that 10% or less of their total iteration time for any one iteration was spent on the factory. If they spent one team spent like 15% for a couple of iterations, but if they spent more than 10% of the time, people got really burned out. If it was like 100% of their time, like they did on the very first project, the people got so burned out that it was like debugging without any end. It was just awful. So they did it in small bits. Again, on the main branch, so they don't have to maintain it in two different places. With management approval, this time around, with some targets, and then once you get these simple wins out, you can be more aggressive in your factory. And stop when your curves go down. Just, you got to know what your limits are. So I was quite impressed by this report because it's sort of like we tried the let's get in there and refactor this crap first and write automated tests. But then they said, well, look, let's try this, clean it up a little bit first and then write automated tests. And this has been more successful for them. So the conventional wisdom I said earlier was that, you know, programmers that are inexperienced write crap and you have to do major refactorings to get any value out of it. And I'm saying, well, no. Uh, any improvement is better than inertia. Any improvement you can do. And small improvements can lead to bigger ones. That's my conclusion to this. So for example, if I spend an hour or two cleaning up something that is ugly, like our error messages, and free up my mind to do something that I have on my backlog, that's a good thing to do. I can write a test, refactor a test, revise a function, clean up something, make it more consistent. There's a lot of things that I can do. So my advice is don't give up on bad code. But what do you do about ugly code? This is Tuco, he looks really ugly. I have a couple of examples of ugly code, none of mine. <laughs> I'm not showing my ugly code. But this code is um, code that my daughter's boyfriend, he works for NASA, uh, launching balloon, a balloon carrying an X-ray telescope in 130,000 feet into the air, trying to measure X-rays from stars, and um, it's supposed to be 10 times more accurate than the previous versions of this. And the name of the product is called, or project is called In Focus. And I, uh, two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to visit their lab. And it's, it's an amazing contraption. Um, it's, it's almost built out of tinker toys, you think. The balloon itself is larger than a football field um, when it's fully inflated. And the housing for the telescope is maybe 30 meters long, 20 meters long. It's pretty big. And it's made out of PVC pipe. <coughs> The control of the telescope, so these are, it's launched, a balloon that's launched holding up this telescope. And you need to control the telescope. Um, and so you, you, gotta, you can't steer a balloon very well. But what you really need to do is that all motion has to be controlled inertially. So, so there are three kind of wheels that you can adjust through the software in interrupt service routine. They're about 
20 uh, kilograms of weight for the wheels, and you can accelerate them to cause changes in momentum to the balloon. And you can then point it at new locations or correct for wind shear if you're detecting that. And so there's um, a, a, another thing that you can control in this control code. It's a 12 kilogram lead brick that you can move around to sort of balance things. And there's a, there's a number of sensors on there, gyroscopes and things like that. Um, it has a magnetometer that you can point relative to the Earth's field. Uh, three cameras for determining positioning by the stars. Um, a GPS. The interrupt service routine cycle is 10, meg 10 hertz, so 10 times a second you're processing and adjusting these things to kind of coordinate where things are. Um, the data is processed through this filtering code, and you communicate it via a 2 kilobyte per second um, upload of commands if you want to. It's very slow. And if you miss the clock for your interrupt service routine, well, you just use the sample from the last time. And so sometimes if you don't get things done in the right time, you may jump and cause it to kind of move around because you're adjusting too much all at once. So it's kind of important that you have a good inter interrupt service routine. Um, so what's really interesting to me about this is it's beautiful technology. I mean, it's engineering at its best. Um, but the code is really ugly. In fact, I brought the code along in case in an open space session and you want to look at the code. It'd be fun. Um, I've looked at it. It was originally written in MATLAB because there's all these filtering algorithms. Um, it was translated to C. It's very light on comments. It, it's written by electrical engineers and physics guys, not programmers. Mega, mega big functions, lots of calculations. But you know, they, the algorithms work. It's the timing and control code that has bugs right now. And they're getting ready for a 2014 launch. The consequences of having these bugs in the control code are really kind of very important. <laughs> if you can't locate accurately, you can't do your measurements, and if you missed uh, interrupt service routine and you have to overcorrect in your positioning, then you might cause these gyrations and it becomes very unstable and that's not a good thing. So I'm showing you some code here again. We can look at this if you want to. Um, here's code that, uh, it was written, it's new code, it was written about um, a year ago to resynchronize the serial interface. Uh, from the uh, uploaded data. And you can see it's nicely structured. I mean, the status is greater than one. Uh, print F, there's print Fs. And then, I like this one down here. If it's added to diagnose when recent occurs, try to understand why. <laughs> oh, okay, print F, resync, do do, whatever, here's the code. I don't know what's going on, but I gotta resync. Okay, that was written by the engineer. Um, this is some of the control code for setting up the vector initialization. <laughs> we can look at this, but anyway, you know, it's like, here's the controller. In fact, Ben said, show the code. I'm happy for you to show the code. He says, the controller is where you should start. <laughs> okay, and look, it's like, okay, here are all these arguments and all these vectors being allocated. It went on and on and on. Now, when you actually get to adjust the various uh, devices, that, you know, the things that you can control, like uh, move the wheel vector at, uh, or add torque in, to figure out what happened with the torque, and then now we're gonna do some calculations to the coordinates and all that. Now, that's really nice to comment. And, and uh, you know, you'd have to understand what's going on, but 
It's, it's, I found that to, I can live with that. But so how is it that there's one engineer who's maintaining this code? How does he live with this code? The algorithms are the abstractions and they already work, so they're not going to get fixed. Um, he's putting in printouts for debugging. This is something I was questioning. If it's, could have looked at some code for that. Code that's no longer working is just commented out. It's not removed. I don't know why, but it's like the selective memory is like, oh, it was in there, but I had to take it out, but I'm still going to leave it there. Um, they're using GitHub. They shouldn't have to do that. Um, but he's leaving, you know, the, the strategy is get it working, get it working in the lab, and leave well enough alone so there's no refactoring. New code is structured. It's got printouts with the bug. I really wanted to go work in that code base and help them a lot. But, oh well. So I have time for one quick story uh, of living with ugly code from my husband, who, uh, Alan Wurfsbach, is the editor for JavaScript, the ECMAScript standard. And how many of you program in JavaScript? How many of you think it's ugly? Okay. <laughs> okay. The problem is, you know, Alan says, you know, when it's, when you got debt, it's easy to accrue and it's hard to pay off. What's lacking is an enforcer from the loan shark, you know, because you're buying time and you're having debt. And the reasons you had for accruing debt, they aren't going to go away. So he had this problem of extending JavaScript. He's, he's working on this right now. Um, of defining a new compatible function. Uh, he wanted to define a fill function for array, a built-in function, and a transfer function that moves one span of elements from one position to another in the same array, as well as filling. And he wanted to be compatible, which was already there. Splice took a start and a length. Slice took a start and an end position. Already, they're different. And index of, which you, to return either a position or a minus one if you can't find an element in an array. There was nothing that was consistent. And I'm, in the interest of time, we could, we could go over this in the, again in the open space and we find to look at this too. Um, is that nothing was consistent between slice and slice. There are a lot of defaults, because that's the way you program in JavaScript. If you don't have to throw in an argument, it will pick a reasonable default. If you start with minus, one, minus numbers, it will start from the reverse of the array. So he ended up with fill, and his, his uh, it, this is kind of the commented um, decision for fill when I start at zero, or I fill with a value by default, if it's not provided, I start at zero, and I start from the, the length of the array to the start, so I'm going to fill it. There's a bunch of details there, some examples of fill. Trust me, those work. Um, so it, it's pretty obscure code. But his design ra rationale is kind of interesting. I, by placing the fill value first, then you don't have to specify any arguments. So it satisfies that JavaScript, you know, use the defaults and define reasonable defaults. And it follows the start count argument pattern similar to splice. He tried slice thinking it would be useful and it didn't because index of didn't quite work with splice, slice. And it seemed easier to specify. Similar thing he did with transfer, although there's some more rules for that, of copying. Again, here's the design rationale. Even the names for things he thought about. He says, I tried copy and move, but copy seems confusing because people expect that the array might create a new array. Well, but we're not. We're just moving it in place. So it's a transfer. And Slice the work, um, and he, he considered an extra embellishment, which is a fill parameter, um, but I couldn't convince
convince myself there's enough utility to justify the added complexity. So his option there was do the simplest thing possible. Okay, so how do you write good code? You can see there's no pass to there. Right? This is a case X K C D. You start, you do the right things first or fast. If I code fast, does it work yet? Yes. Oh no. Okay. Um, it's really hard. My last advice to you is here's what Clint says. Now remember, things look bad, it looks like you're not gonna make it, then you gotta get me. I challenge you. Um, and dog me. Because if you lose your head and you give up, then you neither live nor win. That's just the way it is. So you have people like Alan doing their best with JavaScript. Thank God for people like that. If you're dealing with ugly code, deal with it. It gets more complex over time. It's easier to clean up as you go. Good for you, craftsmen. <laughs> It's hard, not impossible to clean up later, but don't always do the easiest thing. Prepare to do the greater good. Sometimes you may have to work at that and figure out the right way. Whatever you do, make your goal of ongoing sustainability. And I look forward to talking to you the rest of the conference. So, thanks.